Let's turn to God's Word tonight in the New Testament Scriptures, reading in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. going to read together just a few verses of the chapter, commencing at verse 15 and reading through to the end of verse 21. But first, let's bow in a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on the reading and on the preaching of his own infallible word. Our Heavenly Father, we now turn to the Holy Scriptures which alone are able to make one wise unto salvation. And our God, we pray that thou wilt bless thy word to our heart, that even as we read it together, the Holy Spirit will take his word and bless it to every soul. Thou dost know the need of every individual here. Thou dost know those who are not saved. O oh God, save them, we pray. Thou dost see families that are not complete in Christ. O oh God, complete the family in the Lord Jesus. And grant that this will be a night of rejoicing in this church, a night of rejoicing in glory over souls coming to Christ. To this end, now grant to me the infilling of the Holy Spirit with power for the preaching of the word. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading together at verse uh, 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Amen. The Lord will add his own blessing to these familiar verses from his own precious and inspired word for his namesake. The text tonight is taken from verse 18 and verse 19 of our Bible reading. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. As I announced already, our subject tonight is the subject, the blood of Christ. Now I want from the very commencement of the message to be absolutely plain and explicit. By Christ's blood, I mean his blood literally and not metaphorically or symbolically. By Christ's blood, I mean every drop of blood which he ever shed from his circumcision through to his crucifixion. But especially, I mean the blood shed on the cross, what the Bible calls the blood of his cross. Now, I emphasize the meaning to be literal tonight, because the mind of man is ingenious in its attachment to sin and the perverted 
logic of depraved men can take the Holy Scriptures and make them mean the very opposite to what the Holy Spirit intended they should mean. For instance, the Holy Spirit has recorded for us, and I'll have probably occasion to have a look at this text a little later. The Holy Spirit has recorded in Leviticus 17 verse 11, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And that has led, should I say it hasn't led, but it has been made the pretext, by certain unscrupulous liberals, modernists, and neo-evangelicals who would pervert the gospel of Christ and preach another gospel, which is not another gospel, but the devil's counterfeit of the true gospel. They would say that since the blood or the life of the flesh is in the blood, the blood is not the emblem of death, but the blood is the emblem of life. And they tell us when the Jews in the Old Testament economy brought an animal for sacrifice, they were saying, Lord, I am giving my life afresh in dedication unto you. Similarly, when the Lord Jesus died, he didn't die as the sacrifice and the substitute for sinners, but rather he was yielding himself in a supreme act of self-dedication to his Father, an example to all who would follow. My friend, let me tell you, the life of the flesh is in the blood. But the Bible never recognizes life in the blood apart from the body. In other words, if you take the blood and separate from the body, you don't have life, you have death. And in the Bible, it is the blood shed. It is the blood poured out in sacrifice. That is the atonement for sin. The blood, therefore, is the emblem of a life poured out in sacrificial death. When I come tonight to speak upon the precious blood of Christ, I am speaking upon his sacrificial substitutionary death on Calvary's center cross. Now, no more important theme could be imagined. No more important subject could be studied. When you turn to the Bible, you'll find that the blood is the theme of the song of the saints of God. And it is the theme of the sermons of Christ and of his apostles. Now tonight in looking at this subject, I want to say four things about the blood of Jesus Christ. And I always say them all together to start with. In case I get liberty somewhere along the line and I don't reach the end of the outline and I don't reach the end of the sermon. I never, especially in a gospel meeting, I never believe that I have got to get through a preconceived plan for a sermon. I believe in sermons that are messages. And when the Lord tells me to stop, I'll stop, whether I'm at the end of the first point or the fourth point. So I'll give you all four together. The four statements about the blood. I trust that you will never forget them. First, the blood of Jesus Christ is incorruptible blood. And that brings us to the theme of the purity of the blood of Christ. Second, the blood of Christ is indestructible blood. And I want to say a word or two that may shock a few who have studied some of the statements of modern evangelicalism. If you haven't studied such uh, nonsense, then you'll not be shocked. But I want to speak about the permanence of the blood of Christ. The third statement is the blood of Christ is invaluable blood. And there our study is on the preciousness of the blood. And finally, the blood of Christ is indispensable blood. And we'll be studying there the power of the blood of Christ. Four statements. 
I can say them very, very quickly like that. When I have a scan here, I have a few notes in front of me. Winston Churchill once said to those who would be orators, not that I could ever aspire to be an orator, but he said, if you have notes, never hide them. I don't know if he was right or wrong. I have a few notes written out here in front of me to make sure I stay on the track. And when I look at them, I wonder how in one message I can ever get through those four great statements about the blood. We're going to try. First, the blood of Christ is incorruptible blood, dealing with the purity of the blood of the Lamb. We were reading in 1 Peter chapter 1, and we read that we were not redeemed with corruptible things. If words mean anything, we were redeemed then with something that is incorruptible. And the next verse tells us exactly what that incorruptible substance is. It is the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Corruption is something that follows in the train of sin. As soon as sin entered the world, death came by sin. And corruption is the manifestation or the mark of the, the inward working of death. Where you have death, you have corruption. And you can have neither without the prior entrance of sin. Every child of Adam born by natural generation is born in sin. Every child of Adam is therefore dead in sin. And every child of Adam has therefore the corruption of sin poisoning his bloodstream. And in the bloodstream of humanity there courses this corruption that is due to sin. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ has incorruptible blood. And that sets him apart immediately from the entire stock of Adam. Oh, he is, as we were reading from his word this morning, truly man. He is perfectly human. My friend, he has neither part nor lot in Adam's First transgression and is free from all taint of inbred sin. He alone could say the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. There was absolutely nothing in the pure and spotless nature of the Lord Jesus Christ that could respond to the temptations of the devil. That's why I believe not only in a sinless Christ but in an impeccably sinless Christ. I don't only believe in a Christ who did not sin, but I believe in a Christ who could not sin. Because in Him, the God-man, there was nothing to correspond with the temptations of the devil. He is the sinless one. And therefore we read His blood is incorruptible blood. By virtue of his virgin birth. In that mysterious transaction. Where the Holy Spirit brooded over the womb of the Virgin Mary. Producing the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both psychical and physical. In that mysterious transaction. Called the virgin birth. The Lord Jesus Christ was made a certain to be free from the corruption and the filth, the guilt and the pollution of Adam's inbred sin. By virtue of his impeccable person, Christ lived without sin. And when he came to die his death, though the death of a sinner and a felon was for the sins and the felonies of others and certainly not for his own, we were reading tonight, he is the lamb without blemish. He is the lamb without spot. He is untainted and unspotted. I emphasize the purity of Christ's blood and the impeccable sinlessness of Christ's person because only a Christ 
who is sinless can see of sinners. Only a Christ who himself owes nothing to the law of God can pay the debts of those who do. Only a sinless Savior can be any kind of Savior at all. His blood is incorruptible. The purity of the blood of Christ. The second statement is very closely related to the first. So closely indeed that I doubted whether I would take time to deal with it tonight. And the more I thought of it, the more I felt I should. The blood of Christ is indestructible blood. The permanence of the blood. We come back to this word incorruptible. We are not redeemed with corruptible things. But with something that is incorruptible. Even the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to think a little with me tonight. First of all let's turn to the book of the Psalms. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. The end of the ninth verse says, My flesh also shall rest in hope. Verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I want you to emphasize those words. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now turn to, with me to Acts chapter 2, to the great sermon by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Verse 27, he is quoting the verse we have just been reading. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now what does it mean? Look at verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. He spake of the resurrection of Christ. Now what I'm emphasizing here is that the Lord promised that the flesh, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ would not corrupt in the grave. And we have it by inspiration in Acts 2 and verse 31 that this is a promise that it would be raised again. Absolutely without corruption. Now then in 1 Peter we are told that not only was the body of Christ incorruptible, but the blood of Jesus Christ was incorruptible. And if the promise of incorruptibility meant that the body would be raised, I believe that the promise of incorruptibility means exactly what it says, that the blood would be raised and exalted throughout the countless ages of eternity. I think I can prove that very, very easily. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did not drop from his body to dry and congeal in the dust of Palestine to be trampled forever into oblivion by the thoughtless feet of man. I couldn't for a moment conceive that that which is more precious than anything else in heaven, in earth, or in hell, could ever be allowed by the God of heaven to be trampled forever into the dirt around the hill of Calvary. And furthermore, if the blood of Jesus Christ dropped from his body to congeal and dry into the dirt and the ground, then he failed to fulfill one of the most eminent types of Christ in the Old Testament. If you turn with me to the book of Leviticus chapter 16, you will find there the details regarding the activity of the high priest on the great day of atonement, this once per year event. And on that day of atonement, he had to make first, since he was only a type of Christ, he was not sinless, he had to make first a sacrifice for his own sin. Christ needed no sacrifice for his own sin. As we have seen, he had no sin. And then the high priest made a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. 
And after he had made each of these sacrifices, we are told that he had to go inside the veil. If you would look very carefully at verse 13, he shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. And listen, and bring his blood within the veil. What happened to the blood of the sacrifice on the day of atonement? It was shed and it was brought inside the veil. And yet there are people, evangelicals, fundamentalists, Bible believers, and because of their own peculiar twisted notions of what they call dispensational truth, they will say that the precious blood of Christ did not even have the treatment that the blood of those bulls and goats had, but that it was left to rot on the ground. I believe in incorruptible blood. What happened to the blood of Christ? It was taken by Christ within the veil. I can prove that explicitly from the word of God. If you will turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And I want you to notice what it says. Verse 12. Neither by, that's the usual meaning, by or through of the Greek preposition there. I believe in this occasion, as uh, in some other occasions in the New Testament, it has the meaning of with. With, neither with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place having obtained the eternal redemption for us. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't enter heaven by virtue of his blood shedding. Christ has a natural and inalienable right to enter into heaven. He is the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity. He didn't need to have the merit of the shed blood to allow him to enter heaven. So we cannot say by virtue of his blood he entered heaven. He entered heaven by virtue of who he is. But he took with him, as the high priest took with him the blood of the sacrifice into the holiest of all. Christ took with him not the blood of some animal, but his own precious blood. His own precious blood. And therefore we read in Hebrews 10 and verse 19... We have boldness to enter in by the blood. We have boldness to enter in by the virtue and by the power of the blood. Because he has taken the blood to the mercy seat. I tell you that the blood of Christ is indestructible. It is said of the word of God forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that puts it beyond the grasp of every foul modernist and critic and denier and unbeliever. The word of God is settled in heaven. I believe that when I think of the blood of Christ, I can say it is also settled in heaven. It's sprinkled ever fresh upon the mercy seat. It's beyond the touch of foul hands. It's beyond the trampling feet of unbelieving critics. It's beyond the blasphemies of modernists. Let me tell you, men hate the blood. The enemies of the cross despise the blood. Every devil-inspired preacher mocks the blood. Every modernist plays down the blood. But I tell you tonight, the precious blood of Jesus Christ is indestructible. And when we come to look at its power, you will remember that it is indestructible power. When we come to look at the effects of the blood, you will remember that they are everlasting effects, that they will never be changed by any hand of man or any plan 
of the devil. Thank God his blood is incorruptible. That's its purity. His blood is indestructible. That is its permanence. There's a little verse of a well-known hymn. I love the hymn. I appreciate the meaning of the hymn writer, but he's got it wrong. He's got the words wrong. And if some of you good musicians and poets could rearrange the words to get the words as well as the thought right, I would much appreciate it. There's a verse which said, The blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. I get the meaning. I, I believe in the, in the great vision that the hymn writer had of the power of the blood extending into and throughout eternity. But you see, it puts a time limit on it, and that's the mistake. The blood shall never lose its power until... My friend, the blood shall never lose its power, full stop, or period, as you Americans say. I don't know why you call it period, but still, full stop there. The blood will never lose its power. Never. Throughout all eternity, we will be sustained in glory by the virtue and the everlasting value of the precious blood of Christ. It is indestructible blood. Third statement about the blood is not only is it incorruptible and indestructible, but the blood of Christ is invaluable blood. Its preciousness is now before us. We were reading tonight in 1 Peter 1 and verse 19 that we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Though the blood is little esteemed, by carnal men, though ungodly men would mock it and reject it. Let me tell you to God, to angels, that may surprise you, but even to angels and to saints, it's the most precious thing in heaven, in earth, or in hell. Men down here would sell their souls, and they do sell their souls for a little gold. Or the gems of material wealth. There's gold in heaven. There are gems in heaven. My friend, when you look to heaven and get the vision of it as it's given in the word of God, let me tell you, the precious thing in heaven is the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 5, and in verse 9, we read, They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Hallelujah. That is the precious thing in heaven. Preciousness of the blood of Christ. What a thing. Could I suggest to you tonight three reasons why it's precious. Its preciousness is seen first when you consider the dignity of Christ's person. Whose blood is it? It's Christ's blood. The dignity of Christ's person. We were studying that a little this morning. Who is he? He is eternally God. And he is yet perfectly man. And he is this one person with two distinct natures. The only mediator between God and man. And the only saviour and redeemer of God's elect. What a person. Beyond description. Beyond the dreams of the greatest theologian. Or the greatest philosopher the world has ever seen. Even with the inspired record in her puny little minds. Cannot conceive of the immense, the infinite, the eternal dignity of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20. The Holy Ghost has recorded a word. Which many people quibble at and they try their best to get around. But it speaks in verse 28 of the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. 
the church of God, mark the word, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, of course, in his eternal divine person, Christ had no blood. There is no blood, there is no flesh in eternal deity. But, oh, my friends, such is the dignity which eternal deity has lent to the God-man that this strange and solemn description is given. It is the blood of the one who is called God manifested in the flesh. My friend, when I think of the dignity of his person, I see the preciousness of his blood. If a drunken tramp should meet an untimely death in some back alley of a great city in America, it would hardly merit one line in a newspaper. But when you had a president shot and his blood was shed, it filled the world for years and will do for years to come. Ah, my friend, when the blood of the God-man was shed, it was an event to cause heaven and earth to pause to wonder. Oh, the preciousness, oh, the preciousness of the blood of Jesus Christ. Can it be that there's a man or a woman so dead in sin and depraved in sin and dominated by the devil that they think nothing of the infinitely precious person and the infinitely precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aye, there are people that dead in sin. Yes, there are people that depraved in their ungodliness. Aye, there are men and women so dominated by the devil that they would spit again in the face of the blessed Lord Jesus and they would trample his precious blood beneath their feet. My friend, I tell you, when I consider the preciousness of the blood, when I consider what it cost God in terms of the humiliation of the eternal word to become flesh and dwell and die amongst us, when I consider that, I wouldn't take all the money in the world and all the pleasures that the world can give and stand in the shoes of a man or a woman who would trample the blood of Christ beneath their feet. It's precious because of the dignity of his person. It's precious because of the depth of his passion. My friend, the blood of Christ was not spilt blood. The blood of Christ was shed blood. The blood of Christ did not drop accidentally to the ground the blood of Christ was poured out in substitution willingly thoughtfully painfully I want you for a moment to turn with me to the 22nd Psalm and I want you to consider some of the statements of this great messianic Psalm it gives you an insight into the inner workings of the mind and heart of the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross. He starts in verse 1 with that great central cry of the seven on Calvary. You remember he cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. You will remember that they mocked him as if they could not understand. And they said he calls upon Elias. They knew right well the import of the Savior's words. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Look at verse 6. I am a worm. 
If the Holy Ghost hadn't said that, I'd be afraid to say it. Here is the eternal Son of God manifested in the flesh. He doesn't come to sit in a palace for his mission is not merely to redeem the monarchies and the royalties of this earth. He doesn't come to dwell in earthly splendor, but he comes to see of the very vilest of sinners. What were we? We were worms of the dust. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, says the Holy Ghost. We were worms of the dust. And to see of a worm, Christ Jesus said, Lord, I am become a worm and no man. Can you think of it? Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Read a little more. Verse 12, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 17. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Hands as feet are pierced. He's brought to the dust of death. My friend, you will see something of the suffering of Christ. Mental and physical. And that suffering preceded his blood shedding. I have a little book at home which is written by a very eminent Belfast physician of the latter end of the last century who brought all his learning to bear upon the teaching of the Holy Scriptures on the subject of the sufferings of Christ. He suffered. He suffered indescribably. My friend, the evidence is it was not the nail in his hand or his foot it was not the crushing of the thorns in his brow. It was not the pulling of the bones out of joint. It was not even the spear in the side that killed the Christ of God. The evidence is that he died of a broken heart. That's medically established and proven. The Holy Ghost has taught it long ago. He died of a broken heart. And when that spear was put in, it has been well said, the blood of Christ had already been shed internally and gathered in the sack about the heart. And when that spear was plunged, it issued forth for all the world to see. That blood is precious because it was shed out of the depths of the greatest passion of which the incarnate God was capable. Oh, the love, the wondrous love of Christ manifested on Calvary, his precious blood. When I think of the delight of his people, again I see its precious. I see a poor, dirty, vile, wretched, guilty sinner tramping the way to hell one second, and the next second he's leaping and jumping and praising God. I can say this is precious blood indeed. When I go to a home that was wrecked by sin and see it reconciled by grace, and every day together the people are pleading the merits of the blood, I can say this is precious blood indeed. My friend, when I open the page of Holy Writ, as we have done to Revelation 5 and 9 tonight, and I see that not only on earth, 
But in heaven the people of God are singing unto him who hath loved them and washed them in his own precious blood. I can say this is precious, precious blood indeed. Thank God it's invaluable. It's beyond human computation, the value of the blood of Christ. Let me ask you tonight, have you experienced its preciousness? The Bible says to you therefore who believe he is precious and everything about him is precious. Let me ask you is he, is his precious blood precious to you? Or let me say in closing that the blood of Christ is indispensable blood. We now deal with its power. Now this is really a message. In fact it's ten messages all on its own. I shouldn't say that in case it scares you. But this is a great theme throughout the Word of God. Let me quickly run through the list of the things that can only be done by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to use the theological terms. There's a big theological term for just about every one of these, but we're going to deal with ABCs tonight. So that the wayfaring man, though a fool, can't make any mistake, and there they're in. First of all, let me say this. Sin can only be cleansed by the blood of Christ. 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Hebrews 9, 22. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. My friend, it's, there's not another agency God has ever appointed to cleanse away the sins of men. There is nothing whereby an ungodly man can be pardoned except by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin can only be cleansed by the blood. God's justice can only be satisfied by the blood. I quoted Leviticus 17 and verse 11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Listen, and it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Atonement has to do with the satisfaction of the justice of a thrice holy God. How can God be satisfied? Only by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what he has said. And yet you have people and they're running around uh, parading their self-righteousness uh, and they imagine that they get to heaven because they're doing the best they can and God Almighty will accept the foul works of their filthy hands. My friend, he says, there is but one thing to satisfy God and that is the shed blood of Emmanuel, the Lamb of God. The third thing is this, that God's wrath can only be appeased by the blood of the Lamb. There's a very important verse. Somebody has called it the Acropolis of Christianity. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. It's a vitally important verse. And yet it's a verse that most Christians don't know even exists. How good the devil is. How skillful at blinding us to important things. Romans 3.25, speaking of Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. I'm not going into a long lecture on technical things tonight. Most modern translations will put in the word expiation instead of propitiation. I'm not going in even to the reasons why they do that, but they're wrong. The word is propitiation. The word propitiation means the appeasement of the wrath of God. There is a crazy notion going about nowadays. It has been espoused long by liberals and modernists. And some unthinking pseudo-evangelicals seem to go along with it. That there is no wrath in God. That the pain that a sinner suffers is just the inherent result of sin. That uh, it's just like putting your finger in the fire. You're going to feel the pain. It's part of your action. But there's nothing in God that could be termed the wrath of God. My friend, let me tell you this very clearly. 
in the Old Testament alone, there are over 20 words which are used to convey the theme of God's wrath. And together they are used in the Old Testament scriptures something like 580 times. What is the Holy Ghost thus signifying? He is signifying that there is wrath in God against sin. It is not the unthinking blinded passion of a man who has half gone crazy. It is the unchangeable attitude of a holy God against sin and against those who are in sin. The wrath of God. The New Testament takes it up again and again. My friend, let me tell you, if a sinner is ever to be saved, that wrath must be appeased. John Owen, the great prince of Puritan divines, once said, in order for there to be a propitiation, there must first of all be an offense committed then there must be an offended party whose wrath needs to be pacified. Thirdly, there must be a party identified as the offender. And fourthly, there must be a sacrifice or means of propitiation. I tell you, an offense has been committed. I tell you that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I tell you that the sinner has been identified for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Man, you stand identified as guilty, naturally guilty before God. Thank God the means of appeasing the divine wrath is to hand. Thank God for the power of the blood to put away the wrath of God. That wrath can never be put away except by the blood of Christ. Sinners can only be justified by the blood of Christ. There's a wonderful uh, little word in Romans 5 and verse 9 where it says much more than being justified by his blood justified by his blood I never like reading sermons or even parts of sermons but today I was reading the words of that great Scottish Presbyterian Horatius Bonner some of his hymns are in our hymn book if you ever see a hymn by Horatius Bonner or his brother Andrew you've always got a gem two great Presbyterian preachers Horatius Bonner spoke of the blood and said, The blood contains that which makes white. Revelation 7 verse 14. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Contains that which makes white. Not only the man, but his garments are made white. And he says, This is more than cleansing. Oh, let me emphasize this. This is more than cleansing. It is the same word which is used regarding Christ's transfiguration when his garments became white and glistering. It's the same word which is used to describe the angel's robes at the tomb of Christ. It's the same word which is used in Revelation 4 to describe uh, the garments that are worn in heaven. It is the same word which is used to describe God's judgment throne, the great white throne that's the meaning of the word whiter than snow white as the garments of Christ themselves oh then what power there is in this precious blood of Christ what power power that can take a sinner and cleanse him but power that can justify him and robe him in garments that are as white as the garments of Christ Give him indeed the robe of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Sinners can only be justified by the blood. Sinners can only be redeemed by the blood. Sinners can only be reconciled by the blood. Their consciences can only be purged by the blood. Let me say this to you. Victory over the devil can only be enjoyed by the blood. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the 
blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. If you'd like to live in victory, first of all, you've got to be saved by the blood and kept by it. Thank God it alone has power to overcome Satan. There'll only be safety in the day of judgment by the blood. On that great night of judgment in Egypt, a night that prefigures the time when God will move to shake the world in judgment. He said, The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There are an awful lot of people and they would like to add to the word of God. Well, Lord, when you see how hard I've tried, you'll pass over me. When you see that I've been baptized, you'll pass over me. When you see that I've joined the church, you'll pass over me. My friend, let me tell you, I don't care what denominational name tag you go by. If you think because of that he'll keep you safe in judgment, you'll be damned in hell. He says, when I see the blood, I wonder tonight is the blood mark upon you. I wonder tonight have you been washed in Calvary's fountain. In that fountain opened in the house of David for sin and for uncleanness. I wonder tonight are there people here who have been born of Christian parents and brought up under the sound of the gospel and they have just drifted into a profession of faith. They have just drifted into an acceptance of a religious form. But there is no mark of the precious blood of Christ upon you. Man, woman, young person, you'll perish. Perish eternally. Except you get the blood mark upon you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Entrance into heaven is to be had only by the blood of Christ. What are these? These are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let me ask you tonight, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Let me ask you, are your garments made clean through Jesus' blood? Have you redemption? Have you justification unto eternal life? Have you peace of mind and conscience? Have you peace with God in reconciliation through the blood of Jesus Christ? My friend, the blood alone has power to do these things. How can a person know that that blood saves them? I quoted Romans 3.25. God hath set forth Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And in that word there is the acceptance of the blood. Man or woman, while you have hope in any other way of salvation, you'll never be washed in the blood. While you make excuses for your sin, while you say, well, I'm not just as bad as somebody else and maybe I'll struggle through in some other way, while you are hoping in the works of the flesh and human self-righteousness, while you are trusting in church or religion, while you're putting any hope in anything else but Christ, you cannot be washed in the blood. But oh, tonight, if you by the grace of God are brought to accept that there is cleansing, justification, salvation only through the blood, then that blood will be applied. I close by emphasizing that it is the blood applied that saves. I always in that connection remember an Indian friend of mine, Jordan Khan, who preached in our churches back home on quite a few occasions. He preached a wonderful message in the 12th chapter of Exodus concerning the escape of the children of Israel from Egypt through the blood. And he described very graphically, for he is an artist with words, he described very graphically the picture as the animal was killed and the blood was shed and it was caught in the basin. 
And the hyssop was taken and it was brought and led beside the basin. And they said, but men and women, it wasn't the blood in the basin that saved the firstborn. The blood could be in the basin. The hyssop branch could be lying beside it. And the firstborn in the house would perish in the wrath of God. It was the blood in the basin taken and with the hyssop applied to the doorposts and the lintel of the house that brought salvation. Men and women, the blood of Christ has been shed. Let me tell you tonight, there is everlasting virtue and power in the blood of Christ. There is a sufficiency of power in the blood of Christ to see of ten million worlds were that the purpose of God. But let me say this. That blood will not save you unless and until it's applied. Oh, may God give you the hyssop branch of faith reach out and wash your robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. May God bless you. May he bless his word to you. May you ever have the highest estimation of the precious blood of Christ. Remember it's incorruptible. It's pure. It's indestructible. It's permanent. It's invaluable. It's precious. It's indispensable. For it alone has power to save. May God grant that you'll be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Let's all pray. We do want every head bowed. We do want every eye closed. My time has gone. We have gone much over time tonight. But I feel we have been dealing with one of the great themes of Scripture. One of the most important messages you will ever hear. I wonder, is the blood mark on you? My friend, don't drift through life and drift out to eternity, hoping, persuading yourself that you're all right if your conscience has never been purged by the blood and you can't say, Lord, the blood mark is on me. For he says, it's only when I see the blood that I'll pass over you. Is the blood mark upon you? Man or woman, you need to be saved. If that blood's not applied, it needs to be applied. And tonight, the call of the gospel is to come, wash, and be clean. Has God spoken to your heart? Has he given you a desire to wash and be clean? Has he made you see that whatever you have, you haven't got redemption through the blood? 